They come by land, over water, through the air. Left unchecked, this invasion could prove catastrophic for Vermont. These invaders are not human. They are also not from outer space. They are often right under our noses and sadly under the radar of many Vermonters. They are here. More are coming. They will not stop. What lies at the heart of this Green Mountain invasion? It is the dozens of invasive plant and animal species threatening the land and waterways of our state. An invasive species is a species that's not native to the ecosystem under consideration and causes ecological, economic, or human health harm. So there's lots of plants that can fall into the, that category, um, whether you're talking about a terrestrial invasive plant, which is what I work on, an aquatic species, or an insect, or even a fungus. Non-native invasive species are found in many parts of Vermont today. Uh, they're found in our waterways, um, didymos, zebra mussels, those are some of the ones that people may be more familiar with. They're found along river edges, um, knotweed, phragmites, uh, Insects are coming our way. Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, are not here yet, but they are coming our way. Um, Hemlock woolly adelgid are populations of an insect found in the southern parts of the state at this point. And then terrestrial woody plants are found throughout the state, not in every single woodland and not um, uh, at every single elevation, <laughs> but they are here. A lot of people who are still questioning the invasive plant problem, if it's a reality, um, say that uh, people who do think it's a problem are demonizing these plants. I actually like to think that these plants are just really good at being plants. Um, for one, they're brought from another country and they don't have the diseases or the insects or the other types of predators that would, keep them, would have kept them in check um, in the countries and landscapes where they had come from. So they come here um, and then they can get going and nothing will stop them that's, that's native to Vermont, or not much, we haven't, we haven't seen a whole lot yet. Terrestrial invasive plants are spread by many mechanisms. Uh, one of the most common ways they're spread is there's a big hedge of honeysuckle in front of someone's house or some burning bush or barberry or buckthorn all of which were planted on the landscape by humans. Um, birds may come in and feast on the berries. Um, those berries actually aren't very nutritious, so they'll feast on buckthorn, think that they're getting a nice meal. Um, those berries lack any nutritive quality. Um, they'll fly away, they'll perch on a tree in a forest nearby, and they'll poop out those plants. If there's enough sunlight that hits those, that forest floor, um, the seeds from those mother plants will now start to sprout up. Another way is, um, especially in our riparian areas, water might move them. So garlic mustard seeds, um, goutweed uh, roots, phragmites, knotweed, um, all of those might move by just a little piece of the plant, whether it's the stem or the root, might get into the waterway and land on some, uh, the soil um, downstream. Um, some other ways these plants are really good at being plants is they are uh, pretty tolerant of the cold and they can emerge early in the spring. Um, they also leaf out earlier in the spring. They also retain their leaves later into the fall. So they're starting to get up to a month on either side of the Vermont growing season that our natives are used to having. These plants get enough another few months. I think there's lots of challenges to letting people know about this issue. Um, one of the biggest ones is things look healthy. It's green, um, especially with terrestrial plants. They're on the, our landscape. Um, butterflies, bees, they may still come and use them as um, places to pollinate or gather nectar. Um, they provide shade. So things look, can look healthy unless you know what to look for. If you don't spend a lot of time in your woods or you don't know what to look for, it can be difficult to anticipate the problems that are to come or the problems that are right there. But exactly how serious is this problem? What level threat do invasives pose to Vermont? Didymo is an algae. It is a two-cell algae and it experiences uh, extremely rapid growth once conditions are right for the algae. 
We do have Didymo that has been identified in the Upper Connecticut River, the White River, the Mad River, the Battenkill River. And should we have a bloom that covers the bottom, that covers all of the rocks of the bottom, there is a threat to the habitat that uh, aquatic insects, macroinvertebrates uh, need in order to complete their life cycle. And if that should happen and we lost the habitat for those aquatic species, there's nothing for fish to eat because that's the base of the food chain that moves up and provides uh, the uh, food for fish. If that happens, you have an economic impact in terms of people like myself, a guide, uh, the sale of fishing licenses and the sale of fishing equipment and just sort of the mental image of Vermont waterways is lost. One mature purple loosestrife plant can produce up to a million seeds, 98% um, of which are viable. So that's a lot of seed material that can turn a wetland that was once full of a diversity of um, herbaceous plants, woody shrubs, even some trees that bloom at all different periods of time that produce different kinds of seed that have different places to put for animals to perch. Now you can imagine that place is just one solid mass of purple loosestrife plants. Um, you don't have the diversity of food and cover that the wildlife in that area needs. Think of a bird flying uh, on its fall migration or its sp spring migration. Um, and a lot of the eastern flyway, it's already having a difficult time due to development, finding potentially a place to stop. Um, if it had its favorite places, wetlands that it liked to stop in that are now filled in and developed, it can't stop there anymore. Those birds can't stop there. Keeps on going. Has a beautiful wetland that it used to stop at um, and could find food. And now you have purple loosestrife filling those wetlands. Um, we don't have an infinite number of wetlands or forests, so one by one, if we lose these little gems of areas, then we do lose quality habitat. Asian longhorn beetle is an exotic invasive insect uh, introduced in New York, believed to be a, on wood packaging material back in the mid-80s, and currently it's known to be in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is, you know, in, in, in relative terms, a stone's throw from Vermont. Nearly half of Vermont's trees are susceptible. And from a sugar maker's perspective, all of the maple species are some of the preferred hosts by this insect. So, you know, in worst case scenarios, it could mean a long time from now, probably just because of the slow rate of spread, could mean the end of sugar in Vermont, which would be, you know, devastating to, to many people, right from the producers right down the line to the consumer. Vermont is typically the, the leader in uh, syrup production for the U.S. Last year, we produced roughly 1.14 million gallons, and it was estimated in 2010 we had 3.2 million taps out. This is a, a state that's deeply uh, seeded with the natural resource employment and recreation opportunities. Um, the, all of the species that the Asian longhorn beetle like to use are hardwood trees and those are also the foliage trees so that's a major economic boon to Vermont and uh, just those two things foliage and syrup production being gone I mean that's the doomsday scenario that's n hopefully never going to be the case. Unfortunately managing invasive species is already intrinsically tied to the future stewardship of Vermont's environment. In one sense our rivers, lakes, fields, and forests have become battlegrounds. This film will explore some of the different forces leading the fight. Lake Champlain has been bombarded by the invasive water chestnut plant. Tim Hunt of Vermont's Department of Environmental Conservation is leading the fight. This doesn't have much of a, of a stem on it, but you can see this is close to the surface and see how it branches and there's another rosette. So this rosette could have 10 to 20 seeds and then this could have 10 to 20 and a lot of times you'll have another and another and another all from one seed at the bottom. 
we found 15 uh, rosettes from one seed going up to the surface and each one of those rosettes can produce up to 10 or 15 seeds itself. So when you think about it, it's from one seed you go to, to let's say uh, 10 times 15 seeds. There's 150 seeds dropping to the bottom and if 98% of them germinate the first year, there's 120 or 30 more plants coming up with 10 more seeds each next year. So it grows exponentially and in two or three years from when you have a few little plants in an area, you'll end up coming up to almost a solid mat. With invaders this tough, you need big guns in your arsenal. Well, I mean, basically it's a three-part system, the harvesting system. There's a harvester which cuts the weeds. It has, a, it has a hydraulic front end that drops down into the water about six feet and with uh, belts that come up and there's a cutter bar on the bottom that cuts like a regular mowing machine in the old days, a sickle bar that cuts back and forth. It, the machine is moving forward at two or three miles an hour so the weeds, once they're cut, come back against that nose area and the hydraulic uh, belts bring it up into a hopper in the, in the harvester and the operator moves as, as it gets full under his feet, he moves the load back, back, back to the back of the machine until it's full. And then he moves out of the harvesting area and hooks up with a transporter, which is a higher speed uh, uh, machine that has hydraulic beds also that take the harvester loads in. And, and then he's able to transport them up the lake at a much faster speed so that the harvester can return to cutting and doesn't waste time you know, transporting as well as cutting. So the transporter ideally goes from the harvesting area up to wherever the conveyor is on shore, a shore conveyor, and they unload the transporter there onto uh, one-ton dump trucks with high sides so that we don't lose any of the invasive plants off the side. And they transport them up to areas where we compost for the landowner uh, the, the spoils. And then the landowner who has a farm he took them and tilled them into his soil and is able to grow stuff much, much better. So he's happy to get the compost. We're happy to have a spot to offload all these spoils out of the lake. We've, we've harvested four new sites this year. And if next year we are not able to harvest those, let's say there isn't any federal money by chance, those would be, within a year, they would be grown right back in. The, the amount of value that we obtain by harvesting them this year would be lost within a year or so. So um, it's very critical to keep constant funding. I mean, the whole project runs approximately 500,000, um, maybe a little more, maybe a little less year to year, but a constant source of funding. And that's for the whole of Lake Champlain that we're doing, you know, over a thousand acres plus in 23 other lakes in the state, lakes and rivers. Uh, so the project really is not that expensive in, re in relation to all the commercial money and the money that's made on fishing and, you know, the camps alongside the lake and everything else. It's a huge benefit to the lake for a, a relatively small cost of, of constant uh, maintenance and constant harvesting. Another large-scale assault is underway in nearby Lake George. Though not yet in Vermont, Asian clam has invaded its crystal clear waters and threatens nearby Lake Champlain and beyond. The species Asian clam, Corbicula fluminea, uh, was one that I think the Lake Champlain Basin experts, researchers, and scientists had on the radar, um, but I don't think it was the one that we expected to invade Lake George in 2010 when it was first found. Um, Lake George does drain north through the Lachute River into the Lake Champlain Basin, so the water bodies are connected. Uh, it is fairly inevitable if Asian clam become uh, out of control and populate other sites that they might end up in, in the Lake Champlain proper. If they do, that would be very unfortunate because Lake Champlain is often viewed as a source of invasive species um, for spread to other inland water bodies, both in the Adirondacks and in the state of Vermont.